Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Jenna Hamid, and I'm the programs manager here at the Center for Book Arts. So before I dive in, I just want to remind people to keep their mics and videos off um, throughout the program and feel free to use the chat to um, express any responses or questions um, for our guests today. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Center for Book Arts was founded in 1974 by a bookbinder named Richard Minsky, who's here tonight, today, this afternoon. Hi, Richard. Um, and has since been located in the heart of Manhattan on 27th Street in Broadway. The center is the first of its kind, a space dedicated, at, first of its kind in the US, dedicated to exploring the book as an art object through classes, residencies, exhibitions, public programs, and so much more. You can learn more about our history and programs at the centerforbookarts.org. Um, and if you're in the area, you can reserve a time slot on our website to visit our space and our latest exhibitions. The Book Arts Toward Liberation Initiative aims to center black voices in the book arts and publishing field. This inaugural series was launched to expand the discourse of black book arts, black book artists and black owned presses and to expand our ideas and understandings of the book, not only as an object, but as a framework of understanding language, archive, body and our approach to the book. The curators of this series, Heather Hart and Gina Valentine have developed a four part series of conversations, this program being the second to harness a space to discuss themes and topics within the intersection of blackness, production, and creative placemaking. Each conversation will be documented and archived to be shared widely across mediums and platforms for public viewing. The Center for Book Arts will also be purchasing artworks from some of these artists to add to our fine arts and reference collections as a way to not only support each artist, but to take direct action to expand our collections resources, which will be accessible to staff, researchers, artists, and anyone who makes an appointment to view our collection. We would like to thank everyone who donated to our programs and fundraisers this year. Every dollar helped us launch this pilot program and helps us sustain our other programs and operations as well. A special thanks to Stephen Burry, Deirdre Lawrence, Dave, David Solo and everyone who contributed through the Broadsides for Black Futures fundraiser for their generous support of the series. We'd also like to thank Black Lunch Table for taking part in this exciting collaboration. BLT's primary aim is the production of discursive sites wherein artists and local community members engage in dialogue on a variety of critical issues. Black Lunch Table mobilizes a democratic rewriting of contemporary of contemporary cultural history by animating discourse around and among the people living it. You can learn more about the work that they do at blacklunchtable.com. I'll now introduce the co-founders of BLT who also curated the series and will introduce today's conversation. Heather Hart is an interdisciplinary artist exploring the power in thresholds, questioning dominant narratives and creating alternatives to them through architectures and viewer activation. Her work has been, her work has received recognition and support from Anonymous Was a Woman, the Graham Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, among others. Her work has been exhibited at the Queens Museum, Storm King Art Center, Kohler Art Center, NCMA, Seattle Art Museum, and the Brooklyn Museum, among others. Hart received her MFA from Rutgers University and BFA from Cornish College of the Arts. She's currently a visiting lecturer at Rutgers. Gina Valentine is an inter, Gina Valentine's interdisciplinary practice is informed by the intuitive strategies of American folk artists and traditional craft techniques and interweaves histories latent within found texts, objects, narratives, and spaces. Her practice has received recognition and support from the Ground Foundation, Graham Foundation, NC Arts Council, Art Matters, and the Joan Mitchell Foundation. She has exhibited at venues, including the Drawing Center, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Kew Foundation, 
the Elizabeth Foundation, and NCA Chicago. Gina received her BFA from Carnegie Mellon and her MFA from Stanford. She is currently an associate professor at SAIC in Chicago. So now I welcome Heather Hart and Gina Valentine. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'd like to offer our audience um, a brief statement on the Artist Versus series that Heather and I have collaborated on curating. Um, and also thank you all for coming out today. Um, let's see, this summer, Heather and I were both watching Jill Scott versus Erica Badu on Versus Dancing finding a recipe and cooking each in our respective city, cities. And we felt a soothing in our souls. We felt broken from staying inside and embattled by the news. But this moment was a salve. These are musicians who have been and remain seminal for us. They transport us, spark a soundtrack to memory, seeing them empathize with us and with each other as we sheltered in place. They reached through a digital space and created something together and it felt like a moment we'll log into our collective archive. They connected us through our phones, tablets, laptops, desktops all over the world. For one evening, they connected us. Folks in all of the places felt this love, mutual respect and community, despite all odds. Prompted by this series, we considered the outer limits of what constitutes a book or specifically an artist book. Artist plus book, artist equals book. We determine that books contain language in many forms and invite a corporeal experience of media and speech acts. We considered the book as it is cons constitutive, constitutive of the archive and as it is representative of the body, body of knowledge, extension of the body. From these considerations, we determined abstract themes for our four part series coded language, technical writing, the corpus or body as archive, multivocality and self -author authorship. These categories have guided our conversations around and planning for this series. So today's conversation is based on the topic of technical writing. Language as blueprint, diagram, instruction provides directives for navigating specific systems. Technical writing as is discipline, context, audience-centered detailing what, when, where, how. So why the proliferation of guidebooks and flowcharts, indices, pathfinders since the industrial revolution, symptomatic of epistemolo epistemological, pedagogical, phenomenological, or practical concerns? Amidst a billion specialized fields of knowledge, modern life needs instructions. We were excited to imagine what a conversation between Nansikalelo Mutiti and Mimi Onuoha might produce. In particular, given the various ways their practices have engaged the subject of technical writing. Nansikalelo Mutiti is a Zimbabwean born visual artist and educator. She's invested in elevating the work and practices of Black people's past, present, and future through a conceptual approach to design, experimental publishing, and archival practices, and peer-to-peer -peer collaborations. She's also artistic director for Black Chalk and Company, a platform for archiving and publishing practices that curates cultural events and fosters collaborative projects with peers located in Harare, Johannesburg, New York, Richmond, and other international centers. Mutiti is currently assistant professor in graphic design at VCU. She holds a diploma in multimedia art from the Zimbabwe Institute of Digital Arts and an MFA from the Yale School of Art. Mimi Oduoha is a Nigerian American artist and researcher whose work highlights the social relationships and power dynamic, dynamics behind data collection. Her multimedia practices practice uses print, code, installation, and video to call attention to the ways in which those in the margins are differently abstracted, represented, and missed by socio-technical systems. Onuoha has exhibited and lectured at venues including La Gaite Lyrique, uh, Fiber 
festival, Mao Jihong Arts Festival, Le Centre Pompidou, and Babel Lab in Gallery in San Francisco. She, her writing has appeared in Courts, Michel Nou dans Montonnet, uh, 538, and Quai Verlag. In 2014, she was selected to be in the inaugural uh, class of the Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellows. And in 2017, she was nominated as uh, technically Brooklyn Artist of the Year. Onoaha uh, earned her MPS from NYU Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Program. In 2018-19, she served as a creative in residence at Olin College for Engineering. She is president, presently a visiting arts professor at NYU Tisch. Please join us in welcoming Mimi and Nozzi. Great, okay, I'll start us off. Thank you, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where anybody is, so just, I wanna cover all the bases. Um, hello, thank you, Heather, thank you, Gina, thank you, Jenna, thank you, Devin. I think Nancy and I are both really glad to be here and we're just very excited to get to talk about this, even though I think both of us have also had conversations about how our work is like a little bit tangential to technical writing, but we're going to find ways to kind of bring it all together. So um, we said that we would start, see, look, I knew people would be from different places. Look at all these chats, like London, Barcelona, love it. Okay, so we said we would start just by introducing ourselves a little bit. I know you heard the official introduction, but like that doesn't mean anything. So we're just going to show a few different projects and I'm just going to start. So let me share my screen quickly. Okay, let's share. Hmm, what do I wanna share? I wanna share this one. Okay, let's do that. And then I'm going to make this great. If you have any issues, please feel free to say something in the chat. Also, I speak very quickly. I'm going to try to slow down. So, but let me know if it's too fast, just say something. And I hope all of you can see my website now. That's what should be shared, right? Yes. Okay, Nancy is kind of nodding. So I'm going to say yes. Great. Thanks, Heather. All right, so I'll just start. I want to just go over a couple different projects. Oh, actually, before I say that, I should say that a lot of um, I'm a media artist and a lot of my work is about what it means to turn the world into data and who that affects, who wins, who loses, what that looks like, where that comes from. That is a process that all of you are implicated in, because if you have if you have a cell phone, if you have one of these, then you by now already know that anything you do that's digital, basically not all things, but most things generate some form of data. And so in my practice, I try to treat that as an artifact. And it's an artifact that I see that comes out of a relationship between those who choose to collect data and those really a lot of us who kind of make up the collected. And I think because of this, because I think of it in terms of this relationship, all of a sudden that introduces all these questions of power dynamics. And I like to think of this in a global historical sense, but also in a very intimate um, kind of small, like um, micro sense as well. So I'm gonna talk about, I think three projects and hopefully that can do some work in helping you um, see the way that I like to think about these things. And the first one I'll start with is this, it's called the Library of Missing Datasets. And this really starts, uh, this, is, this is an installation. It is a filing cabinet. It looks very ordinary. And then you get close to it and you can see um, each, it has in it all of these different folders and each folder has the title of a data set, but specifically it has the title of something that we don't collect. So it's something that we don't know. And really what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do in this project when I first uh, came up with it was think about absence and specifically think about the patterns of absence. Think about the fact that we live in a world where a lot, a lot, a lot of data is being collected, but there are still these kind of familiar lines where you see that things won't exist. And often they, they affect people who are in the margins. And so I wanted to kind of ask this question of, can we start, can we think about that? What does it look like to think about that absence, to think about the patterns that are behind it, and also to consider this in a way that isn't always, let's fill every single one of these. The point of this work this is an installation piece. I've shown it in a lot of different places around the world. The point of it is not to say, oh, we need to be collecting all of this information, but rather it's to think again about those relationships. What does it mean? What does it mean that we like a lot is collected, but then there are these things that aren't. And so the way that the, depending on where this, this installation, this piece is shown, Sometimes you can touch it. A lot of times you can't because museums, you know how they can be. So, um, but you can often, you can always see these different, um, these different data sets. 
And the way that I do it is depending on where I show it, what's inside of it changes and is, rela uh, is, is related to that specific area. So this is called, as I said, the Library of Missing Data Sets, but it's like official, could we, oh, you want the title of some of them. Okay, cool. Here, I'll zoom in a bit so you all can see. So this is one that says publicly available gun trace data. This is, I think this one was in New York. Um, so there's some that are like, let me see, number of mosques surveilled by the FBI. This is the cause of this is black church fires that happened in June uh, 2015. Uh, there are some other ones, they kind of range. They, some of them have to do with, there are like all these different reasons for why they're, why they're there. There are some, and I have a whole, you can actually see here. This is the nice thing about showing from a website. If you're interested in that, I have like a whole kind of school of research, which is all about this. If you go to the website, you can click and read far, far more and see more of those data sets. But I just wanna not eat up all of our time. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but something I'll say is that this is actually called the library of data of missing data sets version one. Something that I do in a lot of my work is I show many different versions. I have, I have various versions. Each one is, is different, but I like to say that there are different versions and there's kind of two reasons for that. One is just that I'm really, speaking a little bit to the language of software where you can release different things. And I'm like, I wanna use art in the same way. Uh, so there's that where I wanna say, okay, I can release different versions as I'm thinking through different parts of a particular topic. And then the other thing has to do with, I'm Nigerian. I think um, in a more like kind of traditional, I'm, I'm Igbo specifically, which is an ethnic group within Nigeria. And it, a lot of, there's this kind of like traditional Igbo idea about art, which is that you can't really collect it, that it's not just about the thing that exists, it's all this other stuff that surrounds it. And so I kind of like in a nod to that, I like to create a lot of different versions of things. And so for this piece, this is the first one, Library of Missing Data Sets. And then I have another version of it, which is called the Library of Missing Data Sets 2.0. And it's very similar, but it's, you can see it's gold actually. And this one, um, this one is really focusing specifically on data sets around blackness. And what I was thinking about was this thing I was saying before, this idea of this relationship behind who, what is collected, who gets to collect, who makes up the collected, who has control. And with this, what I was interested in was how there's lots and lots of data that you can see uh, that involves black people, but then this, but who has access to that data, who controls it, who has the, who gets to, who gets to have the terms to control when it gets used or how long it lives or who can actually see it. And so I was thinking of this as a form of extraction. And so this folder, you can see this, this uh, version of the installation. It's actually golden is speaking to that. Okay, so that's one project. I'll now jump to a different one. Uh, this one is called Us Aggregated. This is the third one in the series, but I'm not gonna show the other ones. And this project is actually, it's, um, it's a video. So it's a moving image work. And it kind of starts, actually, I'm gonna do a quick little, a little zoom right here. You can see that right there is my mom. You can't really see it, but I promise she looks so good in this photo, y'all don't even know. So that's her there. And then this here, this is all of the people. I have this photo, is my mom, it's from our family's files. And then everything over here, these are people who Google's reverse image algorithm, reverse image search algorithm has said, uh, are algorithmically similar to my mom. So think about that. There's a photo of my mom who's never been, it's just never been online. And these are all the ones that if you look at Google's reverse image algorithm, search algorithm, which anybody can use, you take an image, you upload it, you can see what is categorized as similar. Uh, and so you can see all the people who are similar. And this is a video. And what it does is it actually scrolls down and you can see different images from my own family's collection. And then all the images that are classified as similar. And as well, you can see how, how they were tagged. So it's this one is animal, that's how Google tagged it. This one was community. This one is interesting because the first time I ran it, it was called standing. And then the second time they tagged it as girl. So those algorithms are changing. And here, what I was just interested, it's called us aggregated because it is thinking about this idea of community, of we, of us, of who forms the us. And crucially, as uh, who, who gets this question again of terms and control, which is why I think it's very related to what we're talking about today. Uh, this idea of who gets to control that forming, uh, that making of a people into an us. And something I was just really fascinated by was thinking about how with a lot of these digital systems, increasingly, we are being constantly grouped, we're constantly being bucketed, we're constantly being assembled, but we don't always get to see that, but we are treated differently as a result of that. And it's very strange, it's a very strange time to be grouped with other people, but then to not really be aware of that and to not have control of it, but to still have effects based, based on it. And I was trying to really tease this out. And so I was doing that using these uh, images from my family. 
the video, as I said, it's scrolling. I wish I had a version of it here. Uh, it scrolls and you, it goes on for like 15 minutes and you can see all these different um, images. And it really does, I'm kind of like thinking of this, this thing, as I say it here, this, this manufactured aggregation of us, this idea that, okay, even if we are grouped first off, like, we don't get to choose that, but then that doesn't mean that we're not in us anyway. And, and where is that? Where is our role? What is the role of the collective? Where is the role of autonomy and agency as we're thinking about that? And this one, I really wanted to use the same kind of grid pattern that you'll you see when you use some of these websites. Um, and there's a lot more I could say about this. Google uses a different thing for their, uh, their algorithms. They do it differently than some other places. Uh, and that too, like this, it's, it just results in a different kind of subtle shaping of the world. And that it's that subtlety that I find myself really interested in. And so the experience of watching this, it goes on for quite a long time. And there's sort of this like drone in the background and it really is meant to, to bring you into this that like, okay, there's something really interesting. There's something that pulls me in, but also do I want to be, I'm not sure. So that is us aggregated. And that, as I said, it's this video. And then this is a more recent piece. This is from last year. Oh my gosh, this year has been so long. This is from 2019. Um, and this piece actually starts from this story that involves W.B. Du Bois, uh, like a famous 20th century black sociologist. And uh, part of the story is that W.B. Du Bois, he goes down to Alabama. Uh, he's funded by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They ask, and he's doing this whole study of this huge, huge um, like study of rural life, of, of black rural life in the US. And so in, he goes down, he does this, he's there for months and months. He collects all of this data. He makes all these charts. I don't know if you've ever seen those WB, I actually don't do boys charts. They're like, that you always, maybe you've seen them. They look like this. He creates lots of charts, lots of tables, all of this, all of this stuff. He, do, he collects it, he like gets all this data, he, all this information, and then he sends it off to this uh, bureau for them to publish it as they said they would do, and then they don't do it. And part of the reason why they don't do it is that they don't like the things that he is showing, what he's saying about the condition of life for black people in the US at that time. And the city he's in is, has this, like is very much ruled by this um, white nationalist group, like, like there's a white power regime that's ruling that the town that he goes to and they don't like everything that he's shown. So they're like, we're not gonna do this. And in this piece, I kind of emulate his, his um, I also do charts like he did, but the charts that I do, I'm gonna zoom in. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't know if y'all can see it. It's just a little blurry. You can, well, you can see the general idea. I do these charts. Um, the difference is that I'm not really trying to just show the data in the same way. Oh, I'll stay with this one. I'm not trying, he, you know, his charts, he's trying to visualize data and I'm actually more interested in a world that needs that data to be important. And so the question that I'm, I was asking and thinking through with this exhibition and thinking through it visually, aesthetically, but also thematically, conceptually, was also this idea, the various absences here, first the absence of his report, but also that need, that, that absence of faith that Du Bois had, or rather that need that he had to take the experiences and suffering of people and to communicate, put that in the form of data, to put that in the form of these charts. And that if that suffering was not in that form, then it didn't count. And that's something that I find myself really thinking about. Um, you can't see, this is, this one says uh, the great impossibility. I wish you could see it better, but it says, what are we trying to prove? And that's something that I really think about. Who is the audience? Thank you, thank you, Jenna. Like, who is the audience? When you're trying to prove something, that means it, like you're, you're saying it's never for the people experiencing it, it's for someone else. But what does it mean if we have to take these things like this kind of like violence and trot, like if we have to take that and put it into this scientifically um, valid form, what do we lose from that? And who does, who does that benefit? What, what happens in that act? What gets lost in translation? Okay, I think that's probably fine. Um, right, I think that's good. Nancy, I think I should just pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to flip my screen. I was actually looking up the um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, infographics as you were talking because I remember that um, he did this work in collaboration with students um, and also wanted to just highlight some details, um, the typography with, uh, within the infographics. Um, 
I think was, was produced using stencils uh, that would be used in engineering kind of uh, diagrams, plan drawings. So I also think that's kind of fascinating, right? Even the kind of the visual quality, the tools that were made, used to, to make this, uh, this very technical kind of, kind of stripping away the idea of our humanity and like kind of, you know, I just think the idea of like using this technical kind of machine language to make these didactic charts there could be something um something there and and probably not the intention of Du Bois to kind of uh do a work that uh feels reductive but uh in our reading of it now you know seeing the gaps see, seeing uh what uh presenting information about the state of life uh is you know using that language and I think Mimi in a previous conversation we talked about that we talked about where uh, they, within the storytelling around blackness, there are gaps which leave out our resilience. Uh, there's there's no charting of uh, moments of exuberance and joy. You know those things are not scripted down because we're not just suffering. <laughs> we are we have very full lives, and a lot of um, the kind of uh, mechanisms that we use to cope and to hold together, like song and culture. Um, you know, are not uh, often like really recorded in, in those ways. The, the, the very technical idea of our strategies for survival are not codified, but always the state of suffering and uh, disenfranchisement is noted down. So I, I think you bring up the idea of gaps is so important. Um, here I wanted to um, uh, use this piece to introduce the way I think about uh, language that language for me is not starting with typography, starting with text, starting with the letter form, but that there are so many places where uh, language appears. There's so many uh, spaces um, and kind of material ideas around um, uh, things that I find to be textual and also things that I find to be instructional. Um, so here the Afrocom, something that I have a huge preoccupation with, especially the Black Power Fist Afrocoms, uh, that this uh, object within itself in one breath tells us about grooming, tending, care, and struggle, pulling together defiance. I think it's such a wonderful mo module of uh, communication. Um, I think a lot about multiples in my work. Uh, these are postcards that I produced, uh, a design that I produced for the studio museum in Harlem. They are like, you know, thousands of these things that kind of exist around, but I also um, think about modules that connect and thinking about um, motif and repetition. And you might see some of this uh, coming through uh, the work. Um, when I am thinking about uh, this idea, uh, ideas around uh, text and blackness, I think about things that we script onto our bodies as well. Uh, again, back to grooming, care, um, and thinking about the hands, hands that write, hands that tend, um, thinking about braiding, especially as something that we use to, to script these things, that braided hairstyles become a language, they talk about status, they speak to a moment in one's life, um, and uh, what that kind of work together, you know, what happens when people are working together, those conversations also is can be encyclopedic or really informal, but also be a, a moment for instruction, people uh, teaching each other things, maybe even teaching about the practice um, I also like to leave a space open uh, to present the process as I am also producing final work and um, thinking about what it means to be involved in uh, publication production, that it does uh, tend to be a space that leaves out particular people. Sometimes publishing, uh, you know, can be seen as, um, you know, a, a an activity that is actually a luxury. Um, you need to have a lot of resources to work in this way, to be able to produce a whole run of a thousand books and then be selling them one by one. <laughs> you're not really making all your money back uh, in one go. You're not making a, you can't see whether you're making a profit easily. So the idea of publishing, I, I think I've always been wanting to be involved, but also trying to make sure that I leave behind a rubric for other people like myself, you know, coming from Africa, other black people, you know, across the world, um, anyone that uh, might feel disenfranchised and separated from the book object, which is an object used to frame us, to name us, to make us subjects, um, that there is a way that they feel they can intervene and 
be involved in production, which means knowledge production, which means uh, being part of the system that produces this authoritative form, which results in the authoritative voice, which is what is passed down in the system of education. And also uh, while, whilst we're working together um, and uh, kind of that idea of socialization is forming. Um, this uh, show, this exhibition, it was my first uh, solo show in New York at Printed Matter. And um, it is one work, even though it is an exhibition showing multiple pieces, because uh, as I'm working, I feel that I'm making elements that speak to each other and the whole cost constellation um, of objects needs to be found together for the message to really be at its uh, peak for the reading to be complete. But of course, uh, just like language, fragments can also speak on their own. Um, unfinished sentences are also important. Um, I think about the tool and the finished object and the uh, and sort of like the implication of these things going back into the spaces that they that inspired them always kind of uh, reverberating. Um, and I wanted to show the Waiting Room magazine um, that was commissioned by Simone D for her Free People's Medical Clinic because there's so many wonderful elements that she pulled in uh, to this piece as she was thinking through the editorial. Um, the medal for the, um, the Order of the Tents, uh, Secret Society of Black Nurses that is like a national institution that's been around for decades. Uh, that um, comes together to support uh, people in, the, in the, their communities, uh, helps to educate people, helps, helps people with medical bills, all kinds of you know, things helping to build uh, new spaces for community and really just uh, women working together to provide support for the community. Um, we all know that black women have been disenfranchised from certain spaces like medicine for a very long time and you know at the point where this becomes a sort of a normative um, trade or profession for black women to come in that they that they band together and actually um, start to do other kinds of work that are tending to the community that are also healing um, this idea of producing objects that go um, that live in the world that are attached to these kinds of uh, ways that I think um, is very important. Um, and, and because I'm also concerned about the kinds of content and what content can actually do, not content for the sake of accumulating knowledge, but content that at the moment of accessing could provide some healing, uh, could uh, um, yeah, give you access to particular tools, different kinds of tools. Something that is not pictured in this, um, uh, kind of slideshow is a contribution by Kimberly Beacoat. Um, at that time, Kimberly was doing something called Gala Tea, and um, we wanted to put uh, something um, from her in here because there were also other images that were talking about um, health medicine uh, from the perspective of, um, you know, of knowledge systems that are outside of the Western kind of uh, medical system. Uh, Simone's photographs from the Muti market in Durban, South Africa, form a, a big part of this publication. They, they flow all the way through uh, this piece. So you're encountering all of these things that we could use to tend to our, our bodies. This is also kind of like you're seeing the ingredients um, of things that we are, that where there's deep seated uh, ancestral knowledge attached um, and kind of these images start to open up ideas around what we use to, to, to tend to our bodies to heal. Um, what is a remedy? Um, but the instance from, for Gala tea, the recipe for a particular tea to heal heartbreak, um, actually lives in the margin of the book, not as, as text, not as words, but as drawings, botanical drawings of all of the different plants. Um, you know, then scripting in the possibility for people to kind of acquire that knowledge for themselves, to spot things around them, not just to give them the, you know, the sort of Latin term or the colloquial uh, term for that plant, but really allowing them to uh, kind of extending that uh, the, um, the information into a prompt. Um, and I wanted to end off here uh, with um, readingzimbabwe.com. I might jump very quickly introduce another project. Um, Reading Zimbabwe being the space for aggregating content about Zimbabwe, who's been writing, you know, to chart who's been writing about Zimbabwe, how many Zimbabweans are involved in scripting the narrative about, about our nation? Why does it matter? 
um, and uh, thinking about how we organize knowledge around a subject and, and the reality of ourselves being subjects, you know, even thinking about how that works within a colonial framework, um, you know, subjects of the crown, you know, subjects of the British Empire, uh, what that what that means and how um, books uh, were used, photography was used to translate and transport information about the natives uh, to to um, to the, uh, you know, to uh, Europe, so that they could understand what was uh, down there in the dark continent. And this has been used, the strategy has been used, the book has been used as a strategy to other and to kind of flatten um, communities. So thinking about other ways that we can organize uh, content around us using our own language uh, that is very specific and relates to uh, things that have, you know, that have occurred to us. Um, also thinking about a visual language, you know, I think a lot about pattern. Pattern is, um, pattern just like uh, text has got modules that can be repeated over time and make these sentences. So throughout uh, this, um, piece, you start to see um, information, you know, I don't tell you why there is this image of this little man and this like uh, other, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to describe what the, what the patterns are, but as you continue to look through the website, you start to see and feel uh, different ideas that are brought to you by these uh, graphic components, these images. So there's also other information, not just a, a one word to describe what content is in this publication, because any piece of text, any object can tell you about many things. A piece of fiction can tell you a political history. Um, a piece of factual history can make you think about the future, can make you imagine the future, or can feel <laughs> like fiction. And, uh, you know, something that is uh, related to religion can also tell you about political power and oppression. So we also are trying to defy the flattening um, of categorization also because we know how when you walk into libraries where you find all the books that are written by our peoples how um, books on literature or any any kind of thing you know how they're flattened into very strict categories maybe all the books that have anything to do with Africa are just under Africa when they could actually be books that are teaching about you know, where inside that book you could learn about architecture and other kinds of things that deal with civilization or, I don't know, anything, sensuality, faith. Um, so trying to defy a flattening. And maybe this last uh, piece some writers can give you to Heartbeats, a publication that tries to think about where our voices have been as subjects that um, other people come to our spaces and interview us and take our narrative and become experts on our story. Uh, this publication um, works to recover those voices from academic texts, from interviews in newspapers, um, uh, academic journals, and brings those voices together in amongst all these different pieces of ephemera to bring, you know, to bring everything together, bring everything to light, kind of um, animate all of the content so that people who, uh, you know, within our community, because there's always some other kind of authoritative figure in between us and our kin, um, allowing these voices to kind of sing together, to speak together through under different themes. Um, it's a fictitious conversation between people in our community and uh, the image of what we want to experience in the future um, and also recovering voices that might be ignored um, or not seen as uh, as authoritative. I want to just pause on this uh, image is the last one I will show and uh, this piece is um, these uh, screen grabs are uh, from a film called Flame, a piece of cinema called Flame by the author Tsiti Dangarembwa. She also has a, a filmmaking practice. Um, and this narrative in Flame uh, shows us uh, the story of the Zimbabwean um, liberation struggle um, from the perspective of two teenage girls. Um, in, these, uh, in this sequence of stills, they're jumping, they're crossing uh, the river, which divides um, the, which is at the border between uh, what, what is now Zimbabwe, called Zimbabwe, and what is now called Mozambique. And uh, so they're jumping across this river to go and, and join the freedom fighters. This is a, a kind of um, 
this is a perspective that we don't often talk about when we think about our heroes, the, the people that fought for the war. Um, and so this book tries to do this level of recovery and, you know, again, echoing the, the idea of gaps uh, that uh, Mimi um, brought up. The cover of the book um, tells you what is inside the book, because we also know how people read <laughs> when you hear, this is a book about Zimbabwean authors speaking. If you're not interested in Zimbabwe, you might never um, pick the, the book up. If it, you know, there's just a, a very interesting way as a, um, you know, small black uh, owned or initiated, um, you know, small independent African press um, that the, the work can easily be sidelined. And so we try to uh, tell people, yeah, you know, we are from there. And actually we're talking about all these different themes. So I just I have the book here. We talk about uh, writing as form. We talk about the activity of reading. Um, we talk about identity, audience, publishing, influence, process, beauty, vocation, community, censorship, all of these things which can be scripted onto any kind of community. So even as we are making the work, we are we are intentional about creating um, conversation that's across, um, you know, different, uh, different um, communities that identify, you know, um, not just thinking about our own, our own selves as audience, though we do definitely privilege um, ourselves as audience when we are writing, when we are making, we are thinking about speaking to ourselves um, as well. And, you know, also just wanted to uh, bring that in uh, because of Mimi showing the Du Bois uh, work and thinking, who, who is this? Who is this for? You know, those those infographics were shown at the Paris Exposition. What does it mean to produce all those infographics and then place them in a space in Europe where all other nations are presenting work about, you know, how glorious and, and incredible. Of course, that, that those infographics were doing particular work about talking about the state of Black life, but, you know, how do you also produce this work that speaks to your own community with, with your own vernacular? Um, and then, um, yeah, what are the other potential uh, audiences and what can the conversation be after that? Great. Nancy, something that I think about when I see, thank you for sharing, I love seeing all of that. And something that I think about, there are a lot of these threads of co just connection between the things that we're saying, even if we're working in different spaces. But one thing that comes to mind is how we are both sitting on top of a lot of contradictions at once. And you addressed it a bit in what you were saying. I think about how, like even in publishing, there's this tension of, you know, having, being able to have this form where you can disseminate information and disseminate, you know, expression, whatever it is, disseminate things to people. While at the same time, the act of writing it closes it down and says, okay, this is like a finished thing. When of course, we know we're talking about processes that are ongoing. And then we talk about, you know, you, you mentioned yourself thinking about this flattening of categorization, photography, books, all of these things that have been strategies to oppress and that also we use and we try to reclaim, make them into, into things that can do something else. And at the same time, there's still, I think, anger in that too and, and having to even do that and having to sit with all of this. And so I wonder how it is that you come and approach those acts, knowing that there are all these different tensions within them, how it is that you proceed when you're thinking about creating work. Yeah, that's really uh, important. You know, I, I've said uh, in the past, for me, a book is a fight and a book is a very dangerous object. And um, there's a quote by Jamaica Kincaid in her, her um, short, uh, no, it's not a short, that one's not a short story. I used to, I started off reading her work um, as a series of short stories, but A Small Place is a novel. And she uh, describes sitting at dinner with a group of people and one of the other guests at the table is British and he talks about, um, he talks about sort of commemorating the queen's death in England and she jokes and says, oh, we celebrate her birth in Antigua. We didn't even know she was dead. And then uh, she goes on to talk about that relationship between the colony and the sort of, um, sort of colonial, uh, you know, fathers, you know, and um, thinking about language. And she says something about the language of the uh, the language I speak is the language of the enemy, and it can only say things from the enemy's point of view. I'm interested in that, in the in 
what, what it is that makes uh, the book uh, so authoritative and kind of understanding that, that language and understanding if there are opportunities to kind of break it down or to sort of um, to take it up. As someone coming from a former British colony, um, I feel like there's so much of that culture that we've cannibalized already. So also acknowledging that there's contradiction and, and tension within my own identity, there's things, there's heavy erosion, you know, from centuries ago that some of the, the recovery that we want to do can probably never be done. And uh, so those contradictions as well. And, and then seeing the book as a dangerous object, but also feeling like I can have ownership over it too. And maybe that sense of ownership means that there's some transformation that I can, you know, encourage. And maybe there is no transformation. I'm I'm really interested in the limits of the the, the project, uh, but I also do acknowledge that sort of co-opting these forms and understanding what distribution networks mean, what um, what information means, how that relates to socialization, how that relates to education, how the, the, the space of education and, uh, uh, you know, plays into control and socializing people out of themselves or socializing people to learn how to other other people, you know, I think I was saying to you, I was saying recently at least, that uh, it's interesting to think about all the PhD candidates in the world and uh, this idea of specializing on one particular thing and what that does. And, you know, I think a lot about anthropology. What does it mean to become somebody that is trained to look at other people, to go into other spaces and study other people and write about those individuals and, and make something out of that content, you know, and all and then all these books and books that are being produced, like ce the celebration of othering that the academy kind of continue to perpetuate. I'm very interested. So. Uh, maybe maybe last thing I could say, and I wonder if I'm actually answering your question. But there's a there's a book that Irma Boom, a uh, 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 designer who was one of my mentors in graduate school, um, Irma Boom designed a publication, uh, the cover of which was made of sandpaper, and I think it was a book of philosophy. So on the bookshelf, when you uh, are pulling that book out, it starts to chafe at the other books that it's next to, the more you pull this book off the bookshelf, put it back, it, there's some tension there. I, I believe in that, producing something that's going to do that. You can, I cannot take away all those books on, of anthropology. I cannot, dis, I cannot uh, tell all the universities, take away that book that is uh, writing about Zimbabwean history, all those history books which are written by white men, you know, leave them there. That's somebody's perspective. So let's have all of the different perspectives and it's, uh, you know, that productive tension, I think, Chris, all the information about us. I, I really, you know, this makes me think, I, when I, I went to university here in the US, I studied anthropology, that was my major. And I remember dealing with, I, I have to say, like, I really, I'm moved to the US, like I'm a naturalized US citizen now. My, I just didn't have the same background. I didn't have the same field of references. And so when I came, I was like, anthropology. Okay, I hear this is like a, 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 you know, a study of whatever. I wanted to think about tech. I wanted to think about media. I went to this field. And I, it was really just a crash course in the idea of who, <laughs> who is at the center, who are in the margins, who is otherized, what, po what position do you have? What perspective do you look with? What does it mean? All of these things, I felt like I really just was really just dipped deep into it. And I'll say there was a point where I just was like, you know what, I actually, and I feel this way very much. I didn't show this, I have some works uh, that talk a bit more about this, but just this point where I was like, you know what, I'm actually not as interested now in having, like, I don't want to have to assume the margins as my place. I'm not interested in this. I just want to move, I want to look away and say, actually, I'm not, no, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm done with this. And of course that doesn't mean I can, I throw, we throw away all these tools, all the tools that we've gotten from, from the West, even though, you know, we think about colonization, we think of, there's a lot of pain that is wrapped up in those tools, but at the same time, you can't throw them away. But there is something very powerful, I think, about being able to problematize them and yeah. to like m pay attention to them and to make them clear. And I love that sandpaper book analogy, this thing of, actually, I'm going to bring this into the materiality, bring it into the foreground, take what is assumed and make it clear. You can see it now. Or rather, we can feel it. We can. We can't just pretend that it isn't there. And that, in itself, I think, does something. Totally. I feel that about your um, 
piece, you know, this, uh, these cabinets with all of those index cards, really powerful, you know, and I wanted to find out how you think about this idea of like positioning yourself in the work, like you're making the decisions about what information is accumulated, what information represents the, the things that the, the gaps that are there. Um, because you said that in each iteration, you are modifying it. Mm -hmm. but, so in a way, you are intuiting a conversation with the community in that location to kind of think about how you can bring out certain things that you feel like are critical points to be aware of, like those omissions. And also, but it is it is coming through your lens. So I, so also this idea of, of publishing the editorial. The editorial is such a, is a powerful place, you know, space mm -hmm. to occupy. Can you talk a little bit about your decision making there? Yes, yes, absolutely. This because that's writing, that's writing, you know, you're not you're not making up the language. Those are those are headings, terms or, or things that that exist in the world. But you're writing by creating the editorial and also thinking about the juxtapositions between those different labels. And it is, I think, one of the one of the most powerful decisions is what you include always. It's I think about archives. The things that you say, the things that you say, this is our history, this is who, this is it, like this is what gets to be here. It is just this very, very powerful ability. And it's one that it's a decision that kind of falls away as the as the artifact remains. The who who decided what should be there, how that should be there, in what order, how it should be there, all of those questions are gigantic, but they just become harder and harder to know as it moves on. And so I think about that a lot in that piece. This is why I love this. You talked about multiplicity too. I feel the same way. I like to show lots of versions of a thing to push against because I think this idea there's a constant incompleteness for me yeah, very much. always always and i never i would never purport to say that this is particularly in that project where i'm talking about missing data sometimes mm -hmm. i've gotten people who reach out to me because i'm you know i'm sort of tangential to the tech scene too so i've gotten engineers who are like we can solve this problem send us or like give google all the list of missing data sets just you wait we will fill them all and i'm like oh no you're missing the point that's you're missing the point yeah that's not yeah the point is not to fill them the point is not to have ownership to collect to know it to solve a problem and then to move on the point is to say that there's always that these these gaps are integral to the system exactly. always always exactly. always they will always be here my well, role you go, yeah. ahead, go ahead go ahead oh just that just that my role is not to like here say that this is the definite one but in, in a way, I think this, you know, someone told me once about, I wish I could remember who it was. Someone said this, this thing that I've always, I always remember, and I tell my students all the time too, that if you, because um, I, I do a lot of mapping stuff, we think about world and like maps and the map that you see of the world, the Mercator map, there are all these issues about it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the place, of course, Africa always is really small, like Greenland is huge, you know, these things. And one of the things that he said that I really liked, he said, if you show people just one version of a thing, then they think that's the only way it can be. If you show them two versions, they think there are two options. And if you show three, then they think, oh, there are a lot of different ways to do this thing. And I think that in my work always, I'm like, okay, I just, here's one, one, one iteration, one other way of doing it. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. It's not always, I mean, when I talk to like uh, gallerists, they're like, this is not, <laughs> this is very difficult to sell. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just like, look, it has to be built into it. You just, I can't compromise that. Because so, it's a premium placed on the unique object. Exactly, exactly. Oh, someone, the idea that there's someone, one. Value system, someone decided that that is how, how we should do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to um, maybe show uh, there's something that I didn't um, present. And just like, I like the idea of completeness. I just wanted to share my screen quickly again and totally also jump in or whatever. Um, so there's a publication I found when I was in graduate school called The Traditional Ways of Putting on Cloth for Men and Women. And you know, the, the kind of publications I was looking up when I was in graduate school were kind of more like, oh, I just want to look at something that reminds me of home. <laughs> all these texts are just like, you know, try, make, you know, bring all of this philosophy and stuff, which is always great to expand your references. Um, but I was like, man, I'm at this amazing institution. And where is the content? Where is the work by other people like me that um, you know references and thinks about with with detail our practices and, and not not only our practices like old ancient our practices contemporary as well and the complexities mm -hmm. of that and not only looking at it from uh, you know postcolonial theory 
perspective, but really technically, like we study other kinds of things, breaking the thing down and talking about, you know, change over time, talking about the technology of sort of cultural practice or the technology of cloth from our own perspective and, you know, and seeing those things as important. And I love this uh, publication. It's actually somebody's uh, master's thesis at um, the University of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Uh, in in Kumasi, um, and that university that he built, the first thing that he put there was actually the art the art program, and the one of the most phenomenal art programs. I love that 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 school. I have a lot of colleagues that um, study there and are, are lecturers there as well. Um, so thinking about this uh, book, you know, it chronic it documents two ways of wearing cloth: one for women, one for men. Very simple exercise very incomplete exercise. There's so many different ways to wear cloth, um, but somebody take it upon themselves to actually to script that into a book. And I love how it breaks things down into also this kind of like uh, engineering language of looking at the object, looking at the mechanism from many different angles at the, you know, seeing different views of the same thing at, at one time. Mm. Um, when I was at Center for Book Arts, I started to think about what the relationship between textile and um, paper was. I started to think about why writing uh, is seen as something that needs to be bound in the book and how the book and clothing, you know, things that have a seam, there's thread, you know, in the gut of the book, there's thread and I'll see in the seams, there's folds, you know, you can fold paper, you can fold cloth and, and uh, the kind of sequential nature of dressing oneself just in a cloth or in clothing and, and things like that. Books have jackets, books have spines, you know, and all this language that relates uh, to, to us. And I started to make this uh, uh, letterpress uh, experiment where I made my own book cloth um, and then um, using, you know, these uh, kind of um, what we, what people call African textiles loosely and, um, you know, kind of uh, imitation Dutch wax and started to screen print, not screen print, but do, I carved letterpress blocks and printed in the in the way that you'd print, you know, books in the olden days, blocks that are kind of um, held down together. And uh, then you've got this big uh, roller that um, presses the paper or cloth and the wood block together so that the impression uh, produces the image. Thinking about um, scripting the body onto these fabric pages, that there also isn't a book cover and uh, interior that is all one. I'm very interested in this idea of the transformation of the book object. It's, it's an unfinished project, but it's one of my, um, I, can I use the word favorite? Is that not formal enough? But yeah, it's one of my favorite projects, just also thinking about the figure as a silhouette and not needing to script all the necessary details. Sometimes people want to come too close and look at you too closely and then write down all the things. I also believe in making work that has gaps that, you know, that intentionally I place gaps. I, I don't allow every viewer to be able to come into the work. You have to understand uh, some of the coded language in there. You have to be from, from the community. Um, and I think that's real. Sometimes we think that the a book object is neutral. It's giving us all this stuff that makes stuff available, but there's always someone that's locked out of that information. There's always somebody who can't access that information. It might not, it's not only the writing style, it's the language, it's the way that it's presented. It's the, the outside of the book and what people perceive from design that this is not for me. Yes. And uh, so these are the things that I'm also uh, uh, tending to contending with, um, you know, reflecting on as I make each iteration of my work, whether it is self-initiated experiments, you know, a production, you know, something I'm making, you know, very specifically for a show or a publication to be distributed uh, or poster to be distributed. I'm always playing around those things. Who needs to access this content? Yes, yes, I completely agree with you. I think a lot of Sylvia Winter, as she talks about this. Um, and for me, what I, I'm always, I'm like this, when people say something is for everyone, I'm like it's not, we know it's not, that's not the case. That means that you're just not being explicit about who yeah. it really is for, but we can tell. And I think a lot more about specificity than about just this blanket idea of whoever, this myth, this myth of everyone. Um, I think we're supposed to move to questions. Really, we could just talk all day, we can't. <laughs> we're supposed to move to questions. Um, and I think Heather is saying that we should type questions into the chat. 
Uh, and they're already, actually, don't see, there's already a question in here from Juliet that you could take. Maybe, maybe I can read it aloud since it's for you, and then you'll be the one answering. I'll definitely also do, do the same for you. <laughs> Great. Okay, so Juliet says, how do you go about choosing color in your work? For instance, the first project you showed is printed on orange paper, the second one is predominantly purple, and the website is pink and red. Where do these decisions stem from? Yeah, um, I, it's actually shocking to me to realize how much color I use in my work. I've always been afraid of color. Colors are a very hard thing for me to select. I, I rarely do projects that are also full color. Um, it, the vocabulary is coming from an economy of means um, is coming from the reality of the publications that I um, experienced when I was a young uh, student in Zimbabwe, and um, that all these books were produced on newsprint paper, black ink with possibly one spot color, and that spot color is probably on the cover, um, or that is they produced the two spot colors, or all of our tests were produced on this bander machine, which is kind of like um, in a way, it's like a it's a analog Rizzo and um, analog Rizzo graph, and it had this purple ink, which had an amazing smell. <laughs> I think you kind of get high off that of that stuff, but um, it is really from an economy of means. So you don't have a lot of money to print full color, so you have to either just print in black or select a spot color, or you can't print in full color, you need two colors that when you overlap them, you can make a third or multiple tones. And that is where the where it comes from, because of who my collaborators are, who my clients are, or what resources are being made available for us to squeeze out part of the budget to make something that we can distribute because working in the art world, you know, often curators want to privilege that one thing that can be sold, the unique object. But when I'm working with people, they're bringing me in because they want to produce something that can go, you know, further, something that's more democratic that our people can access. Um, and so you don't have a lot of money, but you still need to make it beautiful. <laughs> and it still needs to, you know, it still needs to be read. So you can use some ink. I often use a colored sheet of paper and black. Um, and then, you know, it's all so, so the economy of means. So sometimes the references like the orange is coming from being uh, going to get my hair braided actually not braided but my hair cut in salons in Harlem when I started doing my research on hair braiding I wasn't getting my hair braided because I don't actually like people touching my head for a long time I actually do my own hair now so a lot of the salons the color of the walls was orange I still attribute that to an economy of means white paint uh, you know back home is very expensive, you know, any color that's a high demand is very expensive. So something like a dragon fire orange, you know, often the price is much lower um, and it just looks great with black. Um, the the summer, I just can't give you two heartbeats. It's orange, it's yellow and a uh, very rich brown. I did, I, I did not want to print brown. I wanted to use two colors that when they added up, you would get the brown. Um, but because of time, trying doing all the pages, having having the interesting overlaps across many pages. The book is 258 pages. We had to think about time. So we used an, a brown, which was not a flat, dusty, this is Africa <laughs> wilderness brown, but a very rich, full of, this could almost be orange, vibrant, and a really punchy yellow. Very, all, the, all the colors, it's not just any yellow, it's not just any brown. And then the purple for Simone's Way to Room magazine, my, um, you know, we couldn't print, you know, many colors. There's only black on the middle spread and the cover. So we asked, we were able to squeeze in the budget um, those, those two pages having two colors, but the whole publication is printed in the, in the violet. When I was uh, growing up, my, both my parents were medical practitioners. They had um, clinics between them. They, they ran three private clinics between them. And when I got injured once, they they used to I've always used to put this purple ginger and violet on 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 us and the patients when you'd get cut or something, and that that image just reminds me so much of the space of healing tending. Um, so for me, I'm also conflating sometimes the book for the body, you know, the the clothing for the page, 
And so printing the whole book with the ginger and violet is like automatically that object has already had some tending to some healing, some medicine put into it, the ink is medicine. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's good to ask those questions. Sometimes when we're talking about publications, people want to uh, ask so much about the the aesthetics, you know, how you made pretty on the page, how you organize things on the page. I design from the outside, from the materiality, the substance, you know, or the, the ink, the papers, what kind of thread, where the thread or what kind of binding, you know, all those things are, are writing. I'm writing, you know, in every part of that book. This book is a particular size for a reason. Um, so yeah, that's my long answer. <laughs> Thank you, Juliet. That's great. That's really great. Um, Mimi, there's a question for you from Heather. Okay, okay. Can I read that? Oh, yes, please feel free. Uh, it says, Mimi, I love how you spoke about three iterations, uh, about three plus iterations communicates multiplicity, and how you transform iteration of works depending on context as it relates to Nancy's mentioning encoding language. I'm not sure if there is a question there, but maybe you can talk about audience eligibility or code switching. That's a great. Mm, great. Um, yes, I like I like that. Okay, we've got five minutes and probably y'all will want to do a little a little wrap up. So I'm going to try to answer this very, very quickly. But actually, it, I think it connects to a little bit of what you were just saying, Nancy. It's different. I work across. So to start with, I don't, in general, I don't really like code switching to me doesn't really make sense very much. Because like, I don't like sometimes when it's used as an analogy for, for at least for my art practice, because code switching imagines that there's one way that you are, and then you change it when you go somewhere new. And I, I think maybe because I just grew up in between places, I don't think I'm, I'm like, I'm different with my parents than I am with my siblings. I speak, you know, I'm different at home. I'm different in all different places. It doesn't mean that I'm being fake anywhere. It just means, I think it's very true that we are like different things bring out different parts of you. A lot of the work that I, and, I'm, and I think that is a very, that is a very diaspora like way of thinking. It's a very like having grown up in different places and having to make sense of that way of thinking. But nonetheless, it very much influences the work I do. And I think about this as well. In the work I create, I don't have one set format. The format changes depending on what it is that I'm just working with or thinking through. And so there are some things where it's like, okay, this is going to be, um, in fact, let me, I'll quickly share my screen and show, this is one thing I, I didn't show before. But this is a different, pro this is, a, we did this, it's probably the closest thing to technical writing and I didn't even talk about it. But it's, it's called a people's guide to AI. And this is this like thing where I'm working with this, Diana Nussera, we did this thing where we were like, actually, let's do this, starting from this popular education approach to understanding technology. Let's do this thing that actually acts like it's explaining these technologies, but also is situating them within um, social spaces and thinking a lot about what it means for these things to be employed here in this space, whatever. And so we kind of tongue in cheek call this this uh, people's guide, even though we're very specific about who it's for and what it's doing. That is like an education thing. I still, we, we're two artists. When we're in that format, we're like, it makes more sense to, to see it this way. It's very different than some of the other works that I've shown. And I think that that, I don't know, that multiplicity, that feels to me, this like, this is, I just love that book example you did with the sandpaper. This paying attention to the materiality of a thing, the content and the form and all the other things, the context, what it's communicating, how it feels when you see it, the color, like all of these decisions are part of making all of these things. And I think so just a thing that I'm always fighting for is to say there's not one of these that is more important and there's not one that matters more. These questions of the color, as you said that the color, the choices for that, it's tied to all of these, these things, like you talked about, it's tied to this economy of means, it's tied to scarcity, it's tied to all, this is how, this is like the reality of it. And mm -hmm. so that stitching together of all of those things to produce an object or artifact or process or whatever, mm -hmm. I find just incredibly, for me, very rewarding and, and very, very also like necessary. This is, this is the world we live in. I feel like I could say 5 million more things, but yeah. I know we don't have much time. I, I, I really appreciate you bringing up this idea, this multimodal approach, but also I don't always think it's important to name that because yeah, like you said, the reality of making, the reality of speaking to, you use different platforms, different words, different emphasis to get out different messages. And I think, you know, as we are working, it just, I, I see it in your work, it's definitely in my work. I, I will, I think about those things before I decide on the final 
form. So hence, I'm not interested in just creating uh, an aesthetic. I'm thinking about that whole object and then where it will sit, where, it, where is it going to sit? You, you tend to that so much uh, in your presentations. I really appreciate that. Not just thinking about the final object, um, yeah, but where, where will that thing live? There seems to be like this normative way that we view books on a, on a table, on a, on a bookshelf and all kinds of other objects, but you're really sort of tending to the scale of things, the, the finish of things, what, what holds that thing up. And I'm, I'm excited to learn more about the work and those strategies because the work doesn't just stop when you've made it. It's also like how you put it into the space and where you, where you put it. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you guys. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off because I feel like we're just in the middle in the beginning of um, the amazing conversation. Yeah, well, um, good conversations right. don't begin and end with a Zoom uh, presentation. So thank you for <laughs> yeah. appreciating because you, um, yeah, you started something. Yes, yeah, thank we you. just wanted to, to uh, we're not even going to take any time. We just wanted to thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. It's and thanks an amazing conversation. Price. Yeah. And thank you, the audience, like, you know, I mean, continue to follow their work and I'm sure any questions that were not answered um, can be answered that way. Um, have a great day. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you. No one wants to leave. <laughs> we still have 20 people here. I mean, like, they're going to keep talking, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> when I we're have still live on Facebook. students and then there's, you know, people are still there, I start to realize, oh, those are ghosts. Someone has, <laughs> someone has walked away from the computer and just left Zoom on. They're just. <laughs> <laughs> so is some of us. All right. I'm really getting off because I'm. Um, neglecting my class that's going on right, right now. So no I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank guys. you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, this thank you. Really guys. Bye. We can reconnect at another yes. time. Thanks so much. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye, Mimi.